Welcome back to Tap Tempo with me, Matt Lang. This week on the show, I've got Francis Prev. And Francis is definitely considered a bit of a guru in not only just the uh, the dance music spectrum, but electronic music in general. Uh, he's got an extremely long-lasting career. He's been a writer for uh, various electronic music magazines, such as Keyboard, Computer Music, Future Music, etc. For over 20 years, authored a number of books. He's as well a sound designer for a number of companies such as Ableton Live, X for Serum, Korg, Dave Smith, and has worked with all sorts of other clients, everyone from Roland to Avid, Isotope, etc. And on top of all that, he's also had giant beatport hits with Wolfgang Gardner called Yin and Yang. He's killed it on the club scene. He is behind the scenes most of the time. And he's an extremely fascinating person to talk to. Um, he's seen it all and it's, uh, there's a wisdom, you know, that comes with it. Having seen every iteration of this thing since the eighties and he knows it. So we're going to get into the talk with him in just a second. I just want to tell you about a couple of things he did recently. He just came out with a project called scapes, which is all synthesized atmospheres. And he also did a number of presets recently for Xfer and has his own company called simple sound. And really, you can uh, find all of this stuff at his website, francisprev.com. And he recently also just launched an Apple News channel for all the various electronic music news, technology news, all the things. So without further ado, here's my chat with Francis. We did this in, uh, in Austin during South by Southwest uh, a number of months ago. It's been sitting here for a while, but um, it's getting out now. And here's Francis. We got a lot of sense in here. Yeah. What's your favorite right now? Yeah, it's always a right now, isn't it? Yeah. Um always. oh god. I they they would get jealous if I if <laughs> if they heard me say that they that any one of them wasn't my favorite. Um cuz they 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 each have their own thing. Um I'm I think the the Dave Smith I, okay, I can narrow it down to three in terms of favorites because okay. it's always three at any given moment. Um, the Dave Smith Tom Oberheim OB6 is a mainstay right now. Um, I'm having a massive love affair with the new Korg monologue because its limitations are such a big part of its sound. You sort of have to hack it in ways like making the LFO putting the LFO in one shot mode. If you want a second envelope, that kind right, of thing. Right. And, and I like the fact that it, it forces me to, to, to do a little mental gymnastics to get what I want out of it. But at the same time, it always sounds good. So it's okay. like, there's no way you can make it sound bad. Right. So I like that on that level. Um, and then the third thing would probably be uh, the Roland uh, the Roland boutiques. I'm loving the the JP08 and the Juno 106, which are now actually both part of the System 8. Which um, is uh, I guess so. I guess the System 8 would be my my third favorite because it's got everything. Do you get much use out of the um, the System One? Only it looks so. It looks so inviting with the green knobs and everything like that. It's very pretty. Well, the system one is is where the 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 system eight kind of it was sort of the prototype for the system eight. It's the okay. it's the baby system eight. I I like where it is in my rack because it's it's at eye level and I can reach out to it anytime I want. I also use it more than I used my I, my original SH one hundred one is sitting in a corner sure. where it can't be harmed. Right, um, and I use the uh, the model of the the 101, which is 99 percent identical and 100 uh, percent more easy to use. Right. Well, then, as your journey starting, you know, from a musician, keyboardist, how did you make your way into sound design? I I think I was always a sound designer before I was a mus like before I was well, not before I was a musician, but before I was a quote unquote artist. Um, my first two analog synths, and we're talking when I was 14 years old, were the Radio Shack Moog, um, which for trivia buffs is a hybrid of the, uh, the Moog Rogue, 
um, and the Moog Liberation. It actually is more like the Liberation voice, which was their keytar. Mm-hmm. Um, that was my first synth, and that didn't have presets. Right. So no presets means you got to do it every you're time. on your own, yep. just like the kids are now these days. <laughs> um, and then the Korg Poly 6, which was covered with knobs, single oscillator, hard to, you know, I mean, it's like the walls were padded, hard to make a bad sound on that. Right. Um, but when I started buying synths, I, when, I, when I cut my teeth on synths, and we're talking the early 80s, Depeche Mode, Kraftwerk, New Order, OMD, Thompson Twins, Duran Duran, those were the, those were the bands that I looked up to when I, was, when I was starting out. And especially Depeche Mode in terms of sound design. I mean, sure. the sound design on, on every Depeche Mode record from, you know, from the first one all the way through the, the Alan Wilder years. Um, was just just stunning, unusual sounds, whether they were digital or, or analog. So what I got in the habit of doing, because in in the in in that era, we have these instruments that can make any sound, and the model was pop music. So how do you differentiate one pop art, pop artist playing synthesizers from another pop artist playing synthesizers? By their sounds, by their right. taste, by their aesthetic. Mm-hmm. Um, and so the reason the Human League sounded different than Depeche Mode was because they were using different sounds sure. than Depeche Mode, but ultimately the same production techniques, and these are pop songs. Um, so what I would do, I had the, the crazy idea that whenever I would buy a synth, I would erase all the factory presets mm-hmm. because despite the fact that I'm a preset guy now, I like... I wanted I wanted yeah. all my own sounds. So I, I did that get, when I, I got the access virus. I deleted everything. You deleted everything. <laughs> everything, right. yeah. And and that because a I knew that the sounds would be mine. That mm-hmm. way, when I made a song, you know, it's like I was grinding the wheat and 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 raising the chickens and well, and it changes and how you cows. write. Yeah, you know, it's so personal to you. Yeah, you're you're yeah. It's it's. It, it makes the song even more your own. So I would I would erase all the factory presets, and that's also how I would learn the synth. You know, so I, I started out with things like the Poly Six, which was single oscillator, kind of Juno sixty sort of thing. Sure. Um, and you know, I just got, and then you know, uh, seven years later or whatever, when I was in my mid twenties. You know, I was doing that to like a Yamaha TG seventy seven, where I was like wrestling with both FM and samples, and but again, erasing everything in the synth if, that could be erased because mm-hmm. a lot of stuff was in ROM, um, and then making the synth my own, right? Because I think a preset—that's another thing in terms of my aesthetic as a preset designer. Um, rather than thinking of every sound as being part of that synth. I think of every sound as being its own instrument. Sure. Absolutely. I mean, it theoretically is. Right. It is. Right. So when I, when I, when I fire up, you know, like for instance, I'm working on the new Dave Smith Rev 2 right now. And I, one of the sounds that, uh, that I made, I, I guess we could probably call it yeah, up right yeah, now. Yeah, we can play it. Yeah. Hang on a second. Turn Let me get it out of that. Do, 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 do. One of the sounds I made, uh, I made. T- I love string sounds. I just, I, I, I kind of grew up on disco as well. Um, so one of the sounds I made was a recreation of the Arp Omni. Which is the whole, like, level tear us apart thing. Oh, yeah. No, it's iconic. And then, but at the same time, I also made another string sound, which is... Um, more like I, I really wanted to take this fully analog synth and and make it into sound something that sounded more like a, a string orchestra. So um, so I wanted to go with something that was a little bit more more acu- acoustic or organic sounding. Sure. But each of those instruments, um, and I don't want to belabor the point that there's like pressure sensitivity and mod wheel stuff, and but each of those instruments can be played as an instrument rather than just, yeah. oh, this is another preset in the Dave Smith. Absolutely. Um, so, so my aesthetic has always been to try, to try to make things that were their own. They had their own identity. Absolutely. And, I, and I, try, I do that a lot now, all the time with the stuff that I'm doing. 
How do you find the difference between programming on the software synthesizers you're doing on your laptop or Ableton or anything like that versus being hands-on and getting to play this Rev 2? Is it more fun? Is it different? I get shit done faster, that's all. <laughs> I mean... On the laptop, a, you get it faster. No! And when I've got knobs, when, like, uh, like oh, this, yeah? this Dave Smith project, I, you know, I, had, I had blocked two weeks to do it, and yeah. I'm basically done in like four or five days. Wow. Because the knobs are right there in front of me. It's right. like I've got... Th- I, have, I have access to three envelopes simultaneously, and Dave's new operating systems, you can, if you want to assign an LFO, you just sort of touch that LFO button and then turn the knob you want it assigned to, and boom, it's assigned. So... The tactile surface is, you know, speeds things up tremendously. But at the same time, you know, doing banks for Serum or, you know, or the core gadget stuff, you know, I'm, I'm used to working with a mouse. Of course. You know, it's just, there, it, it, at some point in time, it, it really, <clears throat> you stop thinking, when you work with synths for a long, long time, and like for me, it's 35 years now, um, you just... You, you, it, it becomes like breathing. You just stop thinking about of what course. you're doing, and you just like, oh, I need the. You don't think, oh, I need to turn the cutoff. You just turn the. You cutoff. just do it. Yeah, of course, it's a language. Yeah. And what was the first one you actually ever took on as a sound design project? My first sound design project was actually an an effects device that's no longer in production. An effects piece of software that was made by Antares called okay. Filter. Oh, and it was, the, the multi-filter. Yes. Yeah, Noisia it, used to use that a lot for a lot of their resounds. Yes, it, yeah, was, that's it, right. was, it, was, it was four independent multi-mode filters, each mm-hmm. with LFOs and envelopes. And uh, I just got, they, I, they gave me a holler and they were like, hey, do you do sound design? Because you write all these tutorials for Keyboard Magazine. And I was like, yeah, I do sound design. And that was my first gig. Right. Um, I think my that the, everything was sort of piecemeal up until I started working with Ableton. Okay. Um, with Ableton, uh, I had been writing sort of masterclass tutorials for Keyboard Magazine um, for versions one through three, and they were introducing MIDI in four. And the first synth that they were doing, besides the samplers and such, was Operator. And they were like, hey, do you know FM? And I was like, yeah, I know FM, because I, mean, I grew up with the DX7. And yeah, now, again, the DX7, I bulked the DX7. Now, when you're, I, I got to toot my own horn just for a second here. When you're, when you're 19 years old <laughs> and, you, and you're bulking the presets from out of, a, out of a DX7, a lot of the stuff was in ROM, but yeah. you're taking the, the internal presets and you're erasing them all and you're going, I think I'll learn FM today. Right. <laughs> You know, so that that's 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 a bit of a, a ninja skill, and 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 I'm I'm proud to say that I, I love FM. And they asked me if I knew FM, and I was like, sure. And they were like, well, we're doing this new synth. So in in 2003 2004, they said, would you be interested in doing this F, voicing this FM synth? And I said, sure. And it was right around. It was right before Nam. This was back mm-hmm. when Ableton was was launching every Nam. Right uh, when everybody was launching every NAM, and now people launch in the fall, it seems. Um, but they asked me if I if I'd be interested in voicing operator. So I, I was like Christmas break. I'm a college professor. I had five weeks off. I was like, sure, I'll take it on. And they were, without going into into too much detail, they were like, we have. they were like, we're it's going to be shipping with a hundred presets. We've got a bunch of people working on it. Um, we're going to we're, we're only accepting you know, we're only going to build a bank of a hundred. Um, and I thought, okay, well I am, I'll make 64. Okay. And see, and just see how many Mm -hmm. make it into it. Um, and 40. Yeah. Made it into it. And, and thus began my long term love affair with, uh, with Ableton. Of course. So, well, then you brought up earlier, because it was an introduction via writing for electronic musician or was it keyboard? It was keyboard. It was keyboard at the time. So, you na- you actually are a pretty esteemed journalist at this point. And how did you find your way into that role coming from the musician standpoint? All right, well, I have to give a shout out to a guy named Dave Bettino who uh is uh also an esteemed journalist and he's been in the industry forever. At the time he was the editor for a magazine called Music and Computers. And I was interning as yeah. an assistant um, at this this very sort of boutique think tank um, audio conference called Project Barbecue. 
that was held in Texas. And I just wanted to immerse myself in that industry at that point in time. I had, I had already, I had already had a, a stint, um, as a remixer producer in the early nineties. And I, I realized I wanted to move more into technology. So I just figured I'd be a fly on the wall and I would help. And, you know, I got to do things like pick Thomas Dolby up at the airport and all this. And sure. I, I was at one of the dinners and I was seated next to, Dave, and we got to talking about the Apple Newton message pad. Right. Okay. And uh, which, as an aside, because of what happened with this conversation that I'm about to tell you, and now I'm totally rambling, um, I ended up making a piece of software hmm. for the Newton. The only music software uh, that was a, that was actually a musical instrument. I made the first and only drum machine for no the way. Newton with a, a coworker of mine named uh, uh, his name is Steve Cronin uh, back in the days when I was I was uh, working at AMD and uh, I was seated next to Dave Bettino cycling back yeah um, and we were talking about the Newton and there were there were some like like metronomes and circle of fifths and really basic sort of music software and we just got to kicking it about the Newton. And, uh, he's like, wow, you know a lot about the Newton. I was like, oh yeah, I think it's, I think it's, I think it's the future. <laughs> and, uh, it is the future. I've been proven right, but it, it, it's the, it, it, I really, the, I still have it. It's in the closet within arm's reach right now. Um, he's like, you know a lot about this. And I was like, sure. And he's like, I'm doing a piece on mobile software. And like, where they were like the, the Palm pilot. Right. And all that stuff. And uh, would you like to do the Newton section on the, uh, for that cover story? And I was like, I'm not a writer. <laughs> you know, it's like, I, like I, I, he's like, well, you know the topic. You speak well. Yep. I'm an editor. There give, you go. Give it a yeah, shot. Sure. If, if it doesn't work out, you don't write anymore. If it does work out, I'll give you another piece. And I sent it to him, and I got an email back like, the next day, and he's like, I didn't have to edit this at all. Do you want another article? That's awesome. And that was it. Yeah. That, that, and I was just off to the races from there. Right. So. Well, it's funny because, I mean, long before I ever met you, I knew your name because of the Remixers Bible. Wow. Yeah. No, both. I didn't know that, Matt. Yeah, both uh, well, at Berkeley. That. Um both Paul Beckwith, you know, who's now Beckwith right. and Juna and right. Carrie Leva, they both had that book. What? So, yeah, for real. So Paul actually used that for as a reference point all the time. He quoted it a lot. Are you serious? A hundred percent serious. Oh wow. Yeah. It's funny. I had no idea. Yeah. I think they even sold that in the Berkeley bookstore. Oh my God. Yeah. That book is it's such a weird book because I had written uh, for how uh well back it was backbeat books at the time uh approached me about writing a book on on sampling um which was my first book it was called power tools for loop whatever and i begged them not to call it that but yeah. they, I, at that point in time i was not an esteemed journalist so <laughs> i i had i had no say in the matter so they they gave it a title that that i i really think kind of um you know sandbagged the um, the that particular book but it did well enough yeah um that uh, and and i turned it around quickly enough that they they asked me if i would um this was right when garage band happened mm -hmm. and they were like oh my god garage band happened and i was like can you write us a book on garage band and i was like yeah i can do it when do you need it and they're like uh two and a half three months and i was like you want me to write an entire book on garage band in three months and they were like can you we could get somebody else and i was like no i'll do it yeah because one of the this ties into one of my my principles for for establishing yourself in any field is say yes mm -hmm. and then make sure you don't fail oh always yeah. <laughs> always say no matter what the request is if you're establishing yourself just say yes and figure out a way yep. to make it happen yeah and don't ask for anything in don't return. ask for anything just do just yep. just do it just yep. you know because i knew that an opportunity i knew the garage band was going to be you know obviously apple you know so i knew a garage band book would would be relevant. I bet um, you could use that same book now for logic. 
Yeah, well, <laughs> that is a dig at logic. It's, it's, yeah. yeah, kind of. Um, I don't know. It's like I, I, I have, I have a lot of grudging respect for for Garage Band and and, and as a as sort of gateway drug to Dawes. Yeah, but anyway, so I wrote the book on Garage Band, and then you know that did okay. So now I've written two books, and remember, this all started from. Me sit, you know, sitting next to somebody at dinner. Being in a car, oh, yeah. And I, you know, so I took, I did that, and they were like, I was like, look, I got an idea for a book. I want to, I want, I want to pick the book topic this time. Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, they were like, well, what do you want to do? And I was like, well, I've been writing the dance mix column for keyboard. By that point in time, I've been writing it for a good eight years. Um, I said I want to do a book called the Remixers Bible, and. And sort of collect a bunch of stuff that a few other writers had written and then find all the stuff that I really felt was relevant that I'd written. Sure. Um, and sort of compile it and then sort of, you know, spackle over it with new material mm-hmm. and, you know, write a book. And uh, I think they, if they I remember correctly, you had a fair amount of like artist testimonials or artist ideas in there too well writing the dance mix column i was always I, how, okay. I i i'm i'm not i'm not ashamed to say that you know when you're a journalist i mean and every journalist does this so this isn't like some some strange evil mastermind plot it's like every journalist wants to interview the people that they know and like yep um so i would if there was you know once i got the dance mix column there were there were definitely artists i wanted to meet sure and develop, you know, and, and develop some sort of, find out whether or not I even like them as people, mm-hmm. you know, because I like their music a lot. It never, the never meet your heroes thing is kind of, it's very, it, it holds a lot of weight. It's a, it, it's a, yeah. it sure does. Yeah. Um, period. Uh, so, but there were some artists that I really wanted to meet and so on and so forth. And I ended up cultivating some, rela- some relationships back in the day when Cascade was first starting, starting out and Ryan and I. Um, I wanted to interview him for the for the column, and Keyboard mm-hmm. Magazine carried a lot of weight back in the early two thousands. Sure, yeah. Um, so I was like, "Hey, I, I love your music. Can I interview you?" And he was like, "Sure." And you know, and Ryan and I are still, you know, we're still friendly to this day. When he comes through town, we hang out. Yeah, and stuff like that. That's awesome. Yeah, man, I remember I saw like two thousand eight. I want to say when I was living in DC, working with uh, BT. Um, Carrie and I, we went and we saw Cascade play at this old club there. It was called Ibiza at the time. It's it, since no more. But um, at the time, he was, uh, I think that's right around when I Remember came out with Joel. Right. And he was huge. So uh, we went and we were both so disappointed because he played vocal house the entire time. And it was, you know, because he used to do a lot more of the deep house thing. Right. And we we just wanted to hear basically Dead Mouse. <laughs> <laughs> oh, now see, see that's the now that's what we that's were. The way, ca- we were so much later to the party, right? You know? well, we missed it. Yeah, yeah. Well, I don't know that you were later. It's like I, I think Cascade is a perfect example of an artist who just kind of follows what they like, mm-hmm. and yeah. he, he does. I mean, what I got into him during the "It's You, It's Me," um, you know, and 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 stepping out and and the the the, the early house stuff. And I really, really loved it, and, and and I stayed with him for a long time musically. Even yeah. like I remember um, tracks like that. But he's definitely one of those artists who is not afraid to change according to the music he likes at any given moment. No, no, he's a. I mean, he's been going for what twenty years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, how many people can you say yeah. that? About? Nicest guy in the world, too. I've heard that. Yes, I have heard that. And the guy is one hundred percent genuinely nice and real yeah. all the time. Who's your favorite hero you've met? My favorite hero that I've met. We're friends, so I can't, I can't, I can't like, I f- it, it's awkward. Uh, because, because it's like the guy's my friend now. But, right. Well, that often happens. Right. Know? I know. But it, like, uh, the, in terms of heroes that worked out, Steve Duda, definitely. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You yeah. know, it's like, I, it's like, again, another one of those people who's the nicest guys in the world mm-hmm. and just so fucking smart. That like I like you know like every time he speaks when, like when we when we first met yeah um, every time he spoke to me I would like cry oh, um, yeah. he's, he's amazing he's just amazing yeah. yeah and you know him too we're your buds with him yeah. so but uh, he's yeah he by uh, he's definitely like the 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 hero that worked out oh no I mean he's almost so intimidatingly intelligent yeah that I'm, if we go for hikes around uh, his like the back you know the the hills area of yeah. his house. Even just setting him off on the simplest topic, 
it gets down to like a microscopic level of where it works. And I'm having to backtrack trying to figure out where he was five steps before. Yeah. And it's, you know, and I feel like I'm pretty intelligent and it's just no, mind blowing. Steve is completely next level. It is just completely next level. Some, it's something else. And the, and the, and the other, the other interesting thing is I'm a talker. Yeah. You know, I'm one of, you are too. We're both, you know, so I, I generally, if I'm in a conversation, I'm, I'm usually like 60% of that conversation. Yeah. Um, but with Steve, I just shut the fuck up and let him go. <laughs> <laughs> Cause you don't even know how to contribute anymore. That's- right. It's like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I learned, I learned so much from that guy. Yeah. Well then, well, with his sense the- the serum. Yeah. That was a stumble right there. Right. Um, <laughs> more beer, please. I, not even the beer. That was just a little bit of but, um, with serum, you know, you were, you were on that sense from the ground level. Well, again, that's the, the, the keyboard magazine factor where yeah. I wanted to, you know, it was, it, it's a, a, as a journalist, I wanted to meet the people I really, whose work I really respected and, right. and see if we got along. Um, and Steve had a body of work, both with his early software, like sure. LFO tool and, 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 uh, the, the various other early expert, I can't know why am I not able to recite the catalog of expert anyway, um, I wanted to, and, and obviously his work with Joel. Yeah, of course. You know, BSOD yeah. and all that. Yeah. Um, and then you can go back even further into his work with Nine Inch Nails, et cetera, yes. et cetera. A perfect Circle. So, perfect Circle. That's actually, that was the first thing where I was like, oh. Yeah, no, I know. mean, he, Beast. Yeah. Um, so I just wanted to interview him. Yeah. And uh, we did a really great interview. I got to ask all the questions and he answered them beautifully and it, it looked amazing in print and... It worked out really, really well. But during the interview process, we, you know, we, the, we ended up, I guess, liking talking to each other. Yeah. So um, we stayed in contact kind of loosely. Uh, and then Serum came around. Mm-hmm. And he was like, hey, do you want to take a look at something I'm working on? Because you seem to get my software and what I'm doing. Yeah. And I was like, sure. He's like, it's just an alpha. You know, don't, ex- you know, it's going to be buggy and all that. It, well, of course, it didn't. It wasn't buggy at all. Right. Um, and he showed me Serum. And I, like, literally said, I, th- I had the same feeling when I looked at Serum that I had when I looked at Ableton Live. Mm-hmm. I was like, this is a game changer. This is going to change everything with yeah, soft This is absolutely, yeah. this is... This is, the, and again, the, you know, I mean, back to Ableton and, and experts, like those are my two desert island pieces of software. Right. You know, if somebody said, you, you're taking your laptop, your solar powered laptop that will never break to a desert island where you'll be trapped, I would just take, I, I, in terms of software, mm-hmm. I would take, I would take Serum and Live. But when I saw Serum, I had the same goosebumps um, that I had with, with Live. And I said, I said, Steve, what, whatever, whatever I can do to help, let mm-hmm. me know. Oh, absolutely. Um, so I started, so I, I was like, he's like, well, you want to start making patches? And I was like, <laughs> I was like, yes. You're right. I, I have, uh, yeah. I'd be more than happy to. Yeah. So, and that, that's, so I, I started working with Serum during the alphas, um, in the original factory bank that ships with it. Mm-hmm. And I've got like 30, 40 patches in there. Yeah. Um, and Steve is, uh, again, d- to show you what a cool guy Steve is, the, Sound designer's name is embedded into mm-hmm. the patch because yep. he uh, he lets you have your little you know you, your moment to shine absolutely um, it, when you do a patch for Serum and and that's just amazing so I um, so I I did that and I, I I helped him sort through some of the the, the factory bank and and arrange it yep um, and now I'm doing my own banks for it nice so. how many have you done so far um, one. Uh, called Serum Toolkit Volume One. Okay. Um, and there's a that's actually a really good example of my 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 aesthetic as a designer as well. Um, I didn't when I make a if I do a bank or if I get if I get hired, I don't want to make too many patches that are flavor of the nanosecond. Mm-hmm. Um. In the introduction to cycling back to Remixer's Bible, and in the introduction to that book, um, I, in uh, uh, probably a a haze of beer, I decided to write in the introduction that dance music is fashion you can hear. (laughs) Um, It's the it's the only style of music where something can be 
so six months ago. Oh, well, it's so indebted to technology, too, and I think that's part of it. I, I, it's also, fashion and dance music, it really, I mean, I, I stand by that statement. It really is this year, this season's sound, mm -hmm. um, which is cool in a way, and it sucks in a way. But also, as a sound designer, you're a fashion designer, if you want to look at it in that, you know, analogy. And... Look how many genres have been spawned off of individual synthesizers. Oh, absolutely. Dubstep, absolutely. trap, whatever, you know, this yeah. future-based thing. I mean, now you hear it, and it is just distorted serum everywhere. Right. I, 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 don't, I, I don't like, I, 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 I don't enjoy making nail-in-the-ear sounds. Right. Uh, that's just, that's not my cup of tea. Sure. Um, it also comes from the, you know, the sort of Depeche Mode aesthetic and the Kraftwerk aesthetic, where you're making sounds that, that that serve more of a purpose than just to be hard or mean well, or I annoying. A lot of it too is um, I've heard it said that essentially the music you grew up listening to in your adolescent years, primarily. Oh yeah, it's a huge know, imprint. That that's what imprints yeah, on you absolutely. for the rest of your life. So your absolutely. entire aesthetic you know, as a musician is, or, and even not as a musician, but just as a listener, what you'll always harken back to right. is going to be that era in your life. Right. So, I mean, so the stuff I do does, I have like a, I, there's always going to be a, a vaguely vintage, I prefer classic yeah. or timeless sure. element. So when I do these, when I did the first Serum Toolkit, I wanted, I, it's about 20% trendy, you know, at the time, Tropical House and Kygo were the thing. So I right. threw like five of those sounds in there and the the Future House thing with the, FM two to one ratio bass sound. Sure. Um, so I I threw like it's about twenty percent um, fashion mm -hmm. in that collection, but because I, I I'm calling it a toolkit because I'm sort of making timeless sounds that you can use in any genre. Right. Um. There you're always going to need pads. Oh yeah. You know. You and and the and it's not a pad if the cutoff is all the way open. Right. <laughs> you know. So. You know, so I, I tried to make sounds that would work regardless of 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 your of your genre, um, and I wanted to make sounds that I I would use the sort of sounds mm -hmm. that I make when I'm making my own music. Um, so I so for the toolkit one, um, I just wanted to make sort of very timeless, universal. And the thing is, the other packs that are out there for Serum, and they're great for the people who want that really hard kind of you know dubstepy EDMy kind of sound. Sure. Um, that territory has been covered, and people tend to think of Serum as that kind of instrument, mm -hmm. in the same way that Massive it be, you know, became the EDM dubstep instrument. And Serum can do so much more than that, that I wanted to really just sort of break away from that territory that's already been covered by other d designers right. and make something that wasn't going to have a date stamp on it. Right. Um, and I'm doing tier, uh, Serum Toolkit 2. Right now, and that's coming out. Uh, that should be out probably around the time that this interview hits. Um, and Serum Toolkit Two is 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 same kind of thing. It's uh, I, I went a little bit more vintage with it because um, Serum now the new version of Serum, latest version of Serum, mm -hmm. um, you can bring in your own samples. And I'm sitting in a room full of you as can put a, it in the noise generator as a sample. Oh, within the noise, you can drop a sample in the noise generator. Okay, and you can put anything right. you want in that. Is there time stretching in there, or is it just no? It's no. just it's just yeah, just sort Basic. of classic yeah, you know, Akai S six twelve one shot kind of thing. What I loved so much about Serum when I first got my hand on that uh, that same Alpha was that I could import any audio file. I mean, in the wave uh, the wavetable editor, you right. Know, I, I looked at it as a sampler, and I was like, I'm just going to take this four-minute-long file and throw it in there and see how it tries to uh, interpolate it. And that's where a lot of my phone Serum came from was kind of breaking it and i crashed it a lot for that reason right right but um but some of my favorite sounds actually did come from essentially trying to use it as a granular resynthesizer or an additive resynthesizer right i suppose and it's really effective so i mean and i have some of some of like the wavetables in there well you know the new secret handshake for getting for importing stuff into the wavetable no i don't okay you in the formula editor. Yes, God, I genius. know. I know. I love that. In you put the that formula in there. editor, you can type in the note. Yeah. Of the sample that you're dropping in. Uh huh. So if you say if you if it's C three, in the formula editor, just type C three, 
And then whatever sample you drop in, it will know it's a C3. And, <laughs> That's so smart. And, sli- and slice up the wavetable <laughs> that way. I shouldn't say slice, but you know what I mean. I know what you mean, yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's brilliant. So all you have to do is type in the if it if it knows the note it's going to be building the wavetable off mm-hmm. of, it it's Yeah, it's, I I, it's I ready, haven't updated mine in a bit. I just haven't. I so, should. Yeah, so there's that. So with it with 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 Toolkit 2, um I'm in a you know, I have a room full of analog gear. Right. Um and I have my company Simple Sound, which you know, traffics in really high quality um analog instruments, multi sampled. Um, so I went and, and made a bunch of really, really killer one shots yep. with Moogs and Dave Smith and Oberheim stuff. And, uh, so a significant portion of the presets in it are based off of one shots of real analog synths. Right. Um, and I did a little, you know, of my own personal voodoo on them and the combination of the sample combined with everything that's already in serum uh, these patches are really punchy right i'm really really happy the other thing i did with toolkit 2 is i wanted to especially with the the retro wave thing happening right now and you know like i I cut my teeth on depeche mode and now everybody wants to sound like depeche mode so it's here's my chance to shine yeah um I, uh, I i'm doing a, a a couple of different sort of sub banks in it uh, one is a bunch of sounds based on vector synthesis from the Prophet VS, mm-hmm. where I'm using the wavetables to emulate that. Um, another is uh, more uh, D50-ish LA synthesis, where right. I'm, for okay, this is a, an interesting moment. Um, there's a f- very famous D50 patch called Fantasia, mm-hmm. um, which I now I I I do I've, I actually put it in the Rev two for Dave Smith. Um, where I, I recreate this, this timeless, uh, D50 patch, which was originally called Fantasia and I call it Frantasia because I, I, I'm cheesy. Yeah. Um, and the, the bell sound, the, the Fantasia sound, let's see, hang on. Since we've got the, the Rev 2 up and and running, let me grab that. Okay. So the D50 had this sound called Fantasia, which is a bell on top of a really soft sawtooth pad. Yeah, we all know that one. So, really familiar sound. And the thing is, to get that bell sound, to get it to sound exactly like Fantasia, right? unless I sample a D50, which I can't do. Sure. Because Roland owns that, 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 that sample. Um, I have to recreate the harmonic structure yeah of that bell so in serum what i did is i used operator here's ableton again i used operator to recreate the bell component of it Mm -hmm. sampled it put it in the noise generator and then made the pad using Serum's oscillator, right? Of course, and recreated it. And I did that with a few other things, like uh, there's a, a, a D50 sound called Future Pad, and so on and so forth. So I I used my own samples for the sampled layer of it, and then sure. built the pads around it. So there's a sub bank of of sort of LA, it's called LA synthesis, so D50 sounds. Yeah. And then I did a sub bank of of FM stuff because mm-hmm. a lot of people go, oh, Serum, you know, yeah. wavetable. But it also does FM. Sure does. So, um, and then I went in and I, 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 I hacked my way through figuring out what the oscillator ratios um, were for things like the tubular bell sound mm-hmm. um, from the DX and the, the, electric, the famous DX electric piano. So I'm sitting right. in there in Serum, making Serum be all of these other synths. Right. Because I really wanted Toolkit Volume 2, since Toolkit Volume 1 became actually pretty popular. Yeah. Um, I wanted to make Volume 2 more, better, greater, sure. faster, stronger. Right. And that's right. basically what that is. Right on. How's your own music evolving these days? Oh, my gosh. I, uh... God. Long pause... It changed a lot when I decided I didn't want to be a air quotes DJ anymore. Right. Um, Was there a turning point, a moment that caused that? Uh, 
Well, it's somewhat common knowledge for insiders that my partner of 17 years, um, Seabrook, uh, passed away in 2013. And... Going through that process, I mean, we'll we'll avoid all the teary-eyed grief stuff. Sure. But going through that process, you know, when when you're literally with somebody when they die, um, your own life and what you're doing becomes in much like laser sharp focus. Mm-hmm. Um, and I realized that it was a great ride as a DJ, um, but. L- I wasn't really into where dance music was going right. anymore. Um, it's great that other people are. I'm glad that it's it's an yeah, industry. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, no no judgment there. But um, again, you know, like we were, like we'd said earlier, uh, when I first got into dance music, it was about everybody wanted to sound different. Everybody wanted to be unique. I mean. You know a Sasha track when a Sasha track comes on. Absolutely. You know, you know a Skrillex track when a Skrillex track comes on. Or, or well, you used to. Um, you know, it, you know, you certainly know a Dead Mouse track when a when a when a Dead Mouse track comes on. Sure. Um, and it really seems like people that people just want to stick to a, a formula. And uh, as someone who's as obsessed with sound as I am, not. Having that be a strike against me, being you know sounding original mm-hmm. is is some is 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 somehow some kind of detraction right. when you're not sounding just like whoever the flavor of the minute is at any given moment. Sure, um, it just that wasn't interesting to me. Sound is interesting to me. Right. I wanted to. I wanted to. I wanted to. When when I make music, I want to make music that's that's meaningful to me and and. And the whole, you know, the, the, the grief process and, and really, you know, the whole inventory that you take of your life. Where am I now? What do I want my legacy to be? Um, I just, I, it just, it, it is like after, again, I don't want to belabor this, but when you're with somebody when they die, the last, you know, it's like mm-hmm. go, going back into an industry where, you know, it, cons- it consists of doing a show and then hearing what track made everybody's role kick in it just it matters it's, a whole lot yeah it didn't it didn't yeah. it was it's like so i wanted to i really wanted to to focus on 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 who i am as right. an artist and who i am as a person right um so uh sound i i realized that my love of electronic music is a subset of my love of synthesizers sure um some people get you know love music and you know love electronic music and become a synthesizer player i i sort of wanted to just work with the synths and right. the music was became sort of secondary that's not to say i don't make music anymore i'm actually doing film and tv stuff Killer. um i just did a library um for uh a company called liquid cinema mm-hmm. um owned by jeff rona and it was right after it was last summer when stranger things happened right and i was like oh my god this is the this yeah, is that's like you were talking about it yeah. The, yeah that is my wheelhouse is a, yeah. is a great word for it yeah um i i was like oh my god this this speaks to me and I don't have to worry about the tyranny of the kick drum anymore. Right. <laughs> so, do you want to elaborate on the uh, tyranny the, of the kick drum? The, t- the tyranny of the kick drum is my, my as I it is probably will be in the introduction of my my next book. Well, it's a wonderful um, phrase, yeah. but uh, <laughs> it's very visual. It, yes, uh, and especially in, a, in now that we have a much more intimate understanding of tyranny now. Um, <laughs> the uh, like I said, dance music is fashion you can hear. Mm-hmm. And 10 years later, now I'm calling it the tyranny of the kick drum. Um, bitter much? No. I'm, I, it's more that dance music is the only, only musical genre where your track either succeeds or fails based on your selection of kick drum, your processing of kick drum, how how the kick drum is integrated into the mix. Mm-hmm. And let's be honest here, from a musical standpoint, the kick drum is the least important element. Tambourines 
are more musical than kick drums. It depends how you use that kick drum. I think, well, when we're talking house music, yes. But, uh, but I think also, you know, when you look at even some of the hip hop stuff, the way 808s are tuned and everything like that, some of that can be like the way Telephone Tel Aviv did it. It's a metronome, Matt. Not all. Well, in the case. Unless it's breaks. Yeah. Well, okay. I, I'm, yeah, I'm or, not talking house music. I'm talking when it's used as a bass instrument. But remember, yeah, well, but that's, that's, then it's not a kick drum anymore. It's a bass instrument. Sure. I'm talking about, I'm talking about that metronome. The four by four kick. Yes. Yeah. Your, your, when, when, if, if, can you imagine if orchestral music required the metronome be the loudest thing? <laughs> Yep. If the if the conductor tapping the 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 podium mm-hmm. was the most important thing, but I think it also comes down to the space and the venue, and the reason why a lot of classical music is composed the way it is is for the sake that it's going to be performed in a cathedral, and or if it's you know a quartet in a smaller room, the music is written differently. That's why the Romantics they wrote mu- the music itself wasn't as complicated because it's getting performed in these giant spaces, so that really quick notes would get lost with the reverb chamber. Right, right. I and I that's why that's why festival music is is very simple because of the giant reverberant spaces sure. and fewer elements and shorter elements make more sense in reverb. Back to the kick drum. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I wanted. I, I I still love dance music, the right stuff, the sure. stuff the stuff I the stuff I enjoy, and there's a lot of dance music out there that I really still very much enjoy. But there's a there's a lot of there's a lot of uh, of dance music that I really 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 still dig. I mean, I've I have yet to hear a bad set from Sasha, and every time Sasha comes into town, I go see Sasha. He's great. Um, yeah. And but uh, but there was there was so much more music that I wanted to make. Right. Um, some of it with a more vintagey feel, getting back to my roots. Some of it a lot more experimental. I wanted to make ambient music that, lo and behold, doesn't have kick drums. Yeah. Um, and I, I realized that the only way that I was going to be able to, to get back to some sort of creative self-expression was to emancipate myself from the kick from drum. From the kick. And uh, so I did this. So I, I did this stuff for Liquid Cinema. Right. Um, and. Uh, that is really just sort of very, very classic kind of or, or 80s retro wave. Not the Miami Vice-y stuff, more the, mm-hmm. more the, the craft worky Depeche mode kind of angle, the, the more analog-y sounding sure. stuff. Um, and then I'm working a lot in ambient now. Um, I haven't released any of it. I've got an album that I finished um, a while back that uh, I do think I'm going to put out uh, if I ever get around to resuscitating academic um but uh i uh right now it's like i'm i'm really enjoying making making sounds for synths and i've also still managed to get out two remixes so far this year right and i'm working on a a a third for uh bright light social hour i'm doing oh cool collaborations with um a guy named uh derek van scoten who's uh has worked as dvs and is currently working as uh his alias is cloud chord and uh, we just did a remix for some friends of mine um, called Autograph. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, Jake Carpenter and I did a collaboration for Academic right. um, back when he was working as the Chaotic Good. I remember that. Yeah. yeah. And now he's, now he's uh, one of the key members of a group called Autograph, and they do sort of deep, modern, deep house. Um, so we did a remix for that. And... You know, we just we just sort of did it as an in, you know an in indie kind of thing, and, and just put it on SoundCloud, and it got thirty thousand plays and a ton of downloads in the first couple of weeks, which was to yeah. me that's I think that still qualifies as some sort of success. I'd say that's success. Yeah, yeah. And then um, I've got a, a new remix uh, that I did for uh, MC Flipside's uh, project, The Night Owls. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, that should be out right around the same time as as this interview. Um, that's called Everybody Sweatin', and that's a little bit closer to the the dance music sound that people are familiar with. That that's that weird, quirky, somewhere in between techno and tech house. Lots of wobbly, but not dubstep wobbles. Just sort of wonky. Yeah, that yeah. that that. It, it, I mean, I, there there are elements of Claude Von Stroke that I really really like. I, I really like the dirt, the Dirty Bird. I don't give a fuck house sound. Um, 
And, yeah. and I, when I'm doing certain kinds of dance music, I, I, I do that. So that's, that's a, more of a reflection of that. I'm actually really happy with the way that, that I did that remix, uh, last year and I'm really happy with the way it, it, yeah, it, it sounds great. Up. Thank like you. It's really well mixed. Thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah, mixing was ironically for a sound designer. Mixing is definitely the 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 biggest hurdle engineering wise that I've had to clear. I really? Can, yeah, when it comes to making a sound on a synth, I can you know reverse engineer anything I hear. But when it comes to actually engineering a track and getting the compression right and the EQ right and notching out the right frequencies and getting all that, oh, that shit takes me forever. See, I've always gone the other way. I've always found mixing to be easy because I've created every sound to generally fit a space. Right. So the mixing is kind of done in the sound design process already. Well, that's something that I've actually grown into yeah. is designing my sounds to to fit the space. It, that's But again, there's there's... Other than the remixer's Bible, there's no manual for making dance music. So you really no. sort of have to fumble your way through it. And YouTube videos, they're cool. And there are a lot of guys out there who are making really good videos. But I don't want to watch a 20-minute video for 30 seconds of information. Right. Not knowing where that 30 seconds of information is going to be. Right. No, well, that's the problem with you. No. So over the years, you've collaborated with a ton of people. Big names, small names, what were some of your favorite experiences in doing so? Uh, yeah, I really, I really have. I think I enjoy collaboration maybe even in some ways a little bit more than I like working solo because I like the process of bouncing an idea off another artist, especially if that artist is my friend. Every collaboration I've done um, we were friends at the time. So, right. um, like for instance, with, with Gabriel and Dresden, who I've been friends with, I've been friends with Josh for 17 years now. Yeah. We met in 2000, something like that. And before Gabriel and Dresden, I met him back when he was doing his own technology Music man company, or whatever. Mix Man. Mix Man, yeah. 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 He was the, actually, little known fact, he's the guy who invented beat slicing. No kidding. Yeah. Before Recycle. No way. Yeah. That's cool. Um, and uh, so working with working with Josh and Dave uh, was they they it was when I was launching Academic and I had a couple of tracks that they really liked and uh, they were like hey we like these tracks can we kind of like mash them up and bounce them around with you and just sort of take these other tracks Servo versus it was called it was called uh, Servo versus Colossus. Um, and interestingly enough, neither of those tracks have come out yet. The really? original two, I, I may put them out on academic at some point, but, um, we did the, we did those kind of, we, they took those ideas and played around with them and so on and so forth. Um, John Aquaviva and I were roommates no back way. in the eighties. Um, so at some point in time, John and I, John was here probably for a South by or something. And I was like, Hey, we should do a collab with Ollie. Cause I've always loved John and Ollie's work. Right. Olivier Giacomoto. Yeah. Um, and so I, you know, all of, all of these collaborations came out of, uh, came out of friendships and what I wanted to do what, is just like, I like, we like each other's music. Right. So let's make something sure. together. It's pretty organic that yeah, way. It's, yeah. It's, it's, yeah, there's, there's, it's not, it's not like some label is saying you two should do this or, or there's, you know, that there's like a, oh, this, you can help this person's career if you collaborate with them. It's, it's really just like, do we get along well enough to sit in a room full of synthesizers and make something? Right, of course. And, and the thing about collaborations is if you, if you, you can always kind of tell if they're, if the artist, you know, who's, who's doing what in terms of a collaboration, just, just by, well, there are two ways. First off, a, a, a true collaboration doesn't sound like anything else in either artist's catalog, you know? Right. And, and if you are familiar with both artists' catalogs, you can listen to that, those, their catalogs and kind of just like, Oh, this sounds mm -hmm. like other tracks that that artist has done. And sure. other, you know, so, um, so for instance, the track that you and I did together, right. Glow balls, you know, that track, really sort of came out of uh the you know your whole style to editing and grooves and beats mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and my fascination with sine waves yep <laughs> so um you know so so that's how that's how that track came about and yeah, it's and, because of that track i got signed to mousetrap 
Pretty funny how that worked out. The, the Francis, the the Francis magic. Yeah, it's the Francis effect. <laughs> the Francis. That yeah. actually, that the there there is something to it. I don't understand exactly how it works, but it, it, there for some reason, even though I'm always like the guy in the background who's who doesn't have the immediately recognizable name, there is there is some sort of glow that I've noticed, um, and I'm grateful for. So I don't I, want, I don't want that to come off egoy. Um, have there been any negative? collaboration or i guess what have been like the negative sides of it if any i've never had a negative collaboration artistically speaking sure um i think pretty much every collaboration i've done has 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 stood on its own um artistically and some have been you know i mean some have been really influential yeah um, but there have been some downsides on the business side. I think that's yeah. the only, the the only the only downside to collaborations that I've ever encountered is is weird business shit. Do you feel comfortable opening up about how any of that unfolded? Um, I think anybody who knows my catalog will know what I'm referring to. Sure. Um, it's it's I I. I the last thing I want to be known as is somebody who trolls. Oh yeah, absolutely. I don't, I don't want to, I, it's, it's just one of those things where, you know, when to, uh, what a collaboration is, is, is would that track have been made if both people weren't in the same room? Right. At which point, if that's the case, then it's a true collaboration Mm -hmm. with co-writing and co-production and all that. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, the, if there are no ghost producers involved, then it's, it's a 100% collaboration. And sometimes, sometimes those things don't, aren't represented correctly. Right. If you could do anything differently in regards to a situation like that, would have you? No, no, yeah. no, ab- no, ab- absolutely not. Right. No, no. Yin was one of the most influential tracks of its, of its time. And uh, right. I'm, I'm, and the 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 sound that defined that track was something I came up with on the Dave Smith Poly Evolver. No kidding. Yeah, I just I I was sitting in front of the the Poly Evolver and uh, I just was turning knobs and getting and, and getting it to do the, that weird feedbacky mm-hmm. thing. Sure. So and and I I heard numerous tracks by pretty famous artists that tried to recreate that sound mm-hmm. and no one ever quite got it. Right. So when you've got a sound that's that identifiable, it's definitely a collaboration. Right. Oh, and it's a compliment to you too when you have a lot of people trying to replicate that. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I'm, I, I'm really, 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 really happy that yeah. that track happened. Good. Um, no regrets on that. Awesome. Lastly, for everyone who's getting into sound design now, what would be your top three tricks or top three tips that they should know? Okay, if you're getting your first synth or you're getting your first software, the first one would be because of the fact that most synths, whether they're software or or hardware analog, Mm -hmm. um, every synth has a sawtooth and a square wave. Right. And those two waveforms sort of define almost, unless you're doing the weird wavetable-y stuff, like the the big EDM power chord sound is a sawtooth. Yep. Um, the 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 chip tune, eight bit kind of you know classic sound is a square wave. Yep. And unless you're getting into samples, like I said, and, and wavetable, those are the two defining sounds of synthesizer. Two, two defining waveforms, I should say. Sure. Of synthesizers the sawtooth and the square. So you should be able to recognize those two waveforms, no matter how they're processed, no matter how they're filtered, you should always be able to go, that's a saw or that's a square. So, you know, do the, Oh, hey, this is Brutus. Hi. No, he's just going to sniff the microphone. He's not going <laughs> to every, uh, there, there you go. Hang on. This is my kitty Brutus. I'm going to, I'm going to put him in my lap. There you go. Hi. No, he doesn't. He doesn't talk into the microphone. He's not being interviewed. Wishful thinking. Wishful. He's a little kitty. All synthesists must have a cat. That's the that's the second tip. Is get a cat. Yeah. No, uh, that's the 
the first half of the second tip. The second tip is, is well, let's get back. I actually have a, a thought as I throw my cat across the room by accident. Um, here's what a sawtooth sounds like. Oop, that's a, what a really high-pitched sawtooth sounds like. It's got a very buzzy, buzzy kind of bright sound. And if you detune it and chorus it and so on and so forth, you get the EDM sound. Right. Now, the square wave will immediately sound like a Nintendo when you open the filter up. And this is a square wave, which will uh, immediately sound like that sort of Nintendo Game Boy sound. So being able to very rapidly identify those sounds are, is, is going to enable you to reverse engineer what you're hearing on somebody else's track. Sure. But also enable you to know where you want to use, what you want to use as your starting point for sounds you make yourself. Right. Um, and different combinations of those waves. Uh, for instance, if you take two sawtooths and put them two octaves apart, you get the Prince organ sound. Yep. If you get take two sawtooths and and tune them really closely together, just detune them slightly, but give them a really fast filter envelope, you're going to get more of that sort of classic EDM pluck mm-hmm. kind of sound. But knowing that that EDM pluck is a sawtooth, not a square, and that the chiptune stuff is a square, not a sawtooth, that's, that's going to get you started. The second aspect is filtering. And the two primary types of filter are low pass, which is absolutely the most common type of filter. If you walk up to an analog synth and the filter is not labeled low pass or high pass, it's not a multi-mode filter, then it's going to be a low pass. Right. Um, it, that's the default filter type, but sometimes you'll get multi-mode filters, um, which you can switch between low pass and high pass and band pass and notch. Um, so knowing the difference between a, 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 a high pass filter, which removes low frequencies That's a high-pass filter. And a low-pass filter, which uh, removes high frequencies. So I'm going to take a sawtooth, and I'm going to switch this over to low-pass, and then I'm going to... So knowing those two filter types, plus those two waveforms, just like knowing them by heart, knowing Mm -hmm. them every time you hear them, um, another good way to learn filters is to take drum loops and run them through a low pass or a high pass yeah. just to, to figure out how that's working. Once you get those two components in, then the last component is the envelope, right? Um, which can be applied to pitch or uh, filter or amplitude. M- amplitude is the most sure. common. That's what the, so that that's the, the envelope that you're going to find on every synth as an amplitude envelope. And, knowing really really spending some time woodshedding on how the shape of that that envelope is is going to affect the sound um is going to help you set the parameters attack decay sustain and release correctly and there's a little example i do i i I teach college here in austin electronic music courses and one of the the demonstrations that i do is i take a sine wave and I put it through an amplifier envelope. And just using a sine wave, which for people who are more technically inclined, a sine wave contains no harmonic content. It is only the fundamental frequency. In fact, all other waveforms are built upon various volumes of the harmonic series in sine waves. Um, so by just taking the purest tone, a sine wave, and playing with an amplifier envelope, you can go from, say, for instance, you take just the sine wave, and increase the attack time slightly, you can get something that sounds a little bit like a flute. And if you take that same sine wave, the the harmonic content is the same, and give it a very short decay and an immediate attack, you get a malady kind of plucky sound. And 100% different instruments. And yet, the, the it, they sound completely different, yet, in fact, it's the same bass waveform with no yep. filtering. Right. And if you take that same envelope and give it a longer decay and a longer release, that sine wave becomes a bell. Yep. And then if you take that same sine wave and give it a shorter release but a longer decay, 
and play it a little bit lower, you get something that sounds a little bit like an electric piano. And it's all with the same waveform, no filtering, yep. the purest waveform of all, but just that amplifier envelope really defines what we, how we identify that sound, whether it's a mallet, whether it's a bell, whether it's a, a woodwind, just by the shape of that envelope. So when you learn those three things, what those two waveforms sound like, what those two filters sound like, and how to manipulate an amplifier envelope, that's the perfect starting point. Right. It's killer. Thank you. Final. What are you listening to right now? What am I listening to right now? Yeah. I am listening to a 60s and 70s um, easy listening artist by the name of Sid Dale. Okay. And it always sounds like sort of cheesy elevator music, but it's but a lot of it has like real acoustic instruments like horns and strings and, right, right. and that sort of thing. I find that I find that when I'm just kind of chilling out um, in my house, I, I, I listen to a lot of really organic acoustic stuff. I do too. I listen to like singer songwriters half the time and I'll get yeah. ideas. I mean, I'll, I'll get ideas not, not just for like synth sounds, but I'll, I'll, I'll get ideas because back before synthesizers were, you know, available even bef- before the Moog, you know, artists would combine a flute and a trumpet and they'd have them play, have the flute and the trumpet play the same part yep. in parallel yep. and create an entirely new tone from that. Um, there's a, a Mexican artist, uh, uh, Esquivel, mm-hmm. who was huge in the 50s and he, he, they, the, 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 the trendy name for the genre is Space Age Bachelor Pad Music. Okay. And he really revolutionized recording um in that like he would have like a a, a choir a, a group of vocalists sing pow in time with a brass section that was doing a, a sort of pow sound with the brass and then put it into an acoustic reverb right and he was literally treating the studio and a bunch of acoustic instrumentalists as his synthesizer what year was this this is like the late 50s early 60s that's awesome yeah that's so cool so right on anyway all right dude well thanks man thank you thank you for making this happen matt my pleasure cheers peace peace that was my chat with francis prev I would urge you to go to his website because he's doing a lot of cool things. So go to FrancisPrev.com and you can find out about all of them. There are many. See you guys next week.